Everybody's awake today. Last week you lost an hour of sleep. You came in here all sleepy and everything, and today you're wide awake. Let's give this worship team a hand if we can. How many of you know we're spoiled by the worship every week? They're so good. And whenever you're singing, God is listening. And God doesn't really care if you sing on pitch. In fact, he created some of you, you don't even find, you can't find the pitch. But you keep singing anyway, amen? Because what God wants is the fullness of your heart, the devotion of your heart is what he's after. So you keep doing that. Everybody say next weekend. Next weekend, as you come to church, uh, we're going, and we talked about this last week, you're going to see the Passion Play. Last year, we had to cancel the Passion Play uh, because of COVID-19, and this year, we just felt like it wasn't quite right to do a full-blown performance. Usually, it's a couple of hours, and it's like every night for a week or something like that. And it's the last week of Jesus' life here on earth in like Broadway form. So we've condensed it down to about an hour. A lot of it is the music and some of the scenes and a lot of it is video. But uh, we're going next weekend as you come to church, either Saturday night at six o'clock or Sunday morning at nine or 11, uh, you're going to see the Passion Play. And we're gonna start right on time. So if you walk in here 10 minutes late or 15 minutes late, some people walk in right now, it's 20 minutes late, you've missed half the show. So in in basketball terminology, when you're coaching a basketball team, you tell them if you're 10 minutes early, you're late, Uh, which means get there early. Um, And get there uh, on time and be prepared. And as you walk in, this is next week, because we won't be making this announcement next week, I don't believe, but as you walk into church next week, pick up communion, and uh, we won't have a set time. You can take communion anytime you want over the course of that show. Now, I would probably wait until the moment where Jesus is crucified, the crucifixion. That would be a great time to take it, but whenever you feel like your heart is ready, that's when you would take it. So that's next weekend. Passion play, get here on time, Saturday 6, Sunday morning, 9, 11. Are you with me on this? Are you with me? Okay. Then in two weeks, everybody say two weeks. Two weeks is Easter. Inside your bulletin, there is a little insert there uh, with all the times of the services. And this insert is for you to hand out to people and to invite them. We understand that some people are remaining home for health purposes. We understand that, we support that, we encourage that. But a lot of people really aren't that concerned. I see them at the grocery store, I see them at Starbucks, uh, Nordstrom's Rack, uh, (laughs) Gus's Barbecue, but they don't wanna come to church, and that's fine. But my point is a lot of people have just gotten out of the habit of going. And uh, you need to be in church. You can find an hour to get to church every week. This is is his church, and uh, he's called us to get together once a week and to worship him. So I always encourage people at 11 o'clock, we need your help in going to one of the earlier services, either on Friday or at the Saturday, to free up room. Because most people who come to church, and I think we're going to have a great crowd on Easter, I think people are going to start coming back to church in, 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 in numbers again, and And so uh, we want to free up room for those people who don't even know we have Friday or Saturday night services. So take that and use that to invite others, and I hope to see you here in a couple of weeks. Amen. Amen. Now take your Bibles. Take your Bibles and turn to Psalm chapter 23. Psalm chapter 23. If you're a visitor here today, and we have a lot of new people here, and uh, we certainly want to thank you for being here. And... um, I said this last week, when you leave, after you leave here today, we clean everything in here, and this building sits empty for a whole week. There's no one in here for an entire week. And so this is the best place to be in town. But we have been preaching through Psalm chapter 23, and we call it the GOAT, G-O-A-T, greatest of all time, that Psalm chapter 23 might be the greatest uh, chapter in the entire Bible. 
And uh, it's been read more, quoted more uh, throughout the ages. We did this week number one. It's, uh, we're taking one verse a week. And today we're looking at verse five. But uh, I had you stand and read this, and I want to do it t- today, okay? And I, I, I think you have enough strength to stand up. You're, how many of you feeling good? You're feeling good. Okay, let's stand on our feet. We're going to read this uh, together out loud. And the reason we stand is the reverence, reverence. We stand out of reverence for the Word of God because this is a holy book, and we're going to read it corporately uh, together. So we stand in honor of God's Word, amen? So we're going to start with verse 1, read it out of your Bible, or you can look at the words on the screen, but let's read it out loud together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, before you're seated, before you're seated, I want to go back one slide and read verse 5. I just want to read it to you because this is our text uh, today. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. May God bless the reading of his words. You may please be seated. If you have been with us through our study, this is week five out of six, you will have noticed that there's a shift in the middle of this chapter. This psalm begins, it's like everything's rosy-dozy. It's calm, it's lovely. It begins with, I have no worries. I have a shepherd. I get to take naps. I get to lie down in green pastures. I get to rest next to quiet streams. My soul is refreshed and restored. Life is like a picnic. I get to lounge around, no worries, no cares, no stress. The shepherd is taking care of everything. And then we come to verse four, which was last weekend. And if you were here, everything changes in verse four. I wake up from my nap, And I find myself in the valley of death. Dark shadows, fears, danger, life-threatening circumstances. And today, we come to verse 5. I'm surrounded by enemies. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Just two weeks ago, I was napping. (laughs) Laying down by some quiet waters, the Lord taking care of everything, not a single care in the world, and now I find myself in the valley of death surrounded by enemies. I want to ask you, have you ever been there? One day, everything is like going great in your life, and the very next day, everything comes crashing in. You lose your job. Your spouse files for divorce. You have a loved one who dies. You fall off the wagon. Depression sweeps over you. You wake up and you wonder, where did the blue skies and the green grass go? And and where did the shepherd go? And why did my circumstances change? And where is God? And why is this happening to me? Well, we're going to study verse 5. David, who wrote this 23rd Psalm, gives us three beautiful pictures. I hope you're taking notes. 
Picture number one that David gives us is a prepared table, a prepared table. Everybody say table. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This is like a change of scene like in a movie. We were out there in a field and now we're at a feast. We're no longer on a trail, we're now at a table. Kind of an odd change, but not really. You see, whenever a shepherd would lead the sheep to a green pasture, the shepherd would always go ahead of the sheep and find a safe place for the sheep to feed. Shepherds would call this a good tableland. That's what they called it, a tableland, a good tableland. And that's why he uses this phrase, you prepare a table for me. Let me tell you why this is important for the sheep because talked about this in previous weeks that if a sheep was, was scared, and they get scared over anything, if a, if a sheep was frightened, they would not eat because they were fearful. And so the shepherd would go out ahead of the sheep and he would find a field, locate a field, and then the shepherd would prepare it. He would drive out all the enemies, he would clear out any dangerous spots, he would look for any poisonous plants that needed to be avoided. They, he would drive off if there were wolves or, or wild animals. And the shepherd makes sure that there was nothing in that field that could possibly harm those sheep. And that's what God does for us. There are three small but important details concerning the table. Detail number one is God is the one who sets the table. David said, you, O oh God, prepare this table. If you read this carefully, you'll see that God doesn't call Grubhub. <laughs> he doesn't hire a caterer. No, God himself is the one that sets up everything for his flock. You know, if you were to come over to my house, we have this one room, we have a big table in there. We never even go in that room. That table is never, we use it twice a year. Twice a year. We use it at Easter and we use it at Thanksgiving. And it just sits, sits empty, not, there's nothing on it. Now, from time to time, not very often, we'll have guests that will come over to our house. And it's amazing that when the guests get to our house, that table is set perfectly. I guarantee you we've never had a single guest come over to our house and then we ask the guests to set the table. No, it is set when they get there. And I'm not the one who sets it. My children are not the one who sets that table. Take a guess, when the guests come over to our house and that table is perfectly set, guess who it was that set that table? My wife, she's sitting down here on the front row. Give, her, give the wifey a hand. You say, well, why don't you set it? Well, because if I set it, there would be paper plates on that table. And I wouldn't know where the napkin goes on which side or the fork or the knife or the spoon. I, I, I wouldn't know any of that stuff. I don't even know where the napkins are, to be honest with you. <laughs> but just as when the guests arrive, everything is perfect, everything is prepared, in the same way God has prepared life for you and everything you need, God provides for you in this life. The table, write this down, the table is for you. This table of goodness, this table of, of, of sustenance, this, this table that, that has everything you need that God, God set, he set it all up, he set it up there for you. You matter to God. I want you to thank Chuck E. Cheese. How many of you ever know what, you've been to Chuck E. Cheese at one time in your life? Okay, so 
you, you, you know, your, your son or daughter's having a birthday party. When you get there, they've got a, a room or a table that has your child's name, which says that everyone is there to honor this special guest, your son or your daughter. Everything is there and everything is set. And this Psalm, Psalm chapter 23, the table has not been prepared by your parents. This table has not been prepared by your spouse. This table has not been prepared by a giant rat named Chuck. <laughs> this table has been set by Almighty God himself and your name is at the head of the table. You are the honored guest. God has done that for you. That's what you mean to God. And write this down quickly, even though there may be enemies around, the sheep are not in danger of any kind. So as you walk through this valley called the shadow of death, Enemies are everywhere. You have a personal shepherd who has provided everything and who protects you at all cost. We learned last week your personal shepherd has this rod, it's like a baseball bat, and he's got this staff, and he's like, a, he's not like just a shepherd, he's like a ninja shepherd. And he has this rod and this staff and he fights off all the enemies in your life, all the things that you think are out to get you. He gets rid of all those enemies and while he's fighting off the enemies, he's a ninja shepherd, he's fighting all this, he's preparing a table for you in the midst of all your enemies. Picture this scene, picture it. You're in, you're, you're in uh, Death Valley. Your, your enemies are surrounding you. They're out for blood. And normally on your own, you wouldn't stand a prayer of a chance. But your personal ninja shepherd sets a table for you and lets you eat at peace. And all your enemies can do is watch because they can't harm you. They cannot harm you. And you know, there's a lot of symbolism and prophetic stuff in this chapter when you study it. Because who is our greatest enemy? Satan. And Satan is out to kill still and to destroy. And David says, I have a shepherd, and even though I've been in a rough patch or you know you're in a dark place, God says, I still want you to be able to sit down, have a good meal, feel my love, feel my provi provision, know that I still got your back, nothing's gonna harm you, relax, I'm here to make you feel honored and blessed while you're eating. Even though you're surrounded by enemies, the good shepherd, is gonna take care of you and allow you just to have a good day. You say, how do you, know, how do you know all that's true? Well, because of picture number two. Here's picture number two. David said that his head was anointed with oil. Everybody say oil. You anoint my head with oil. Now, this is very symbolic, but it's very factual. And what I mean by that is that over in the Middle East, the shepherds who have sheep, they literally, literally anoint their sheep with oil. You say, well, I never knew that. It's because you're not a shepherd. <laughs> but a shepherd factually, literally would take oil and pour oil on the head of every sheep. Now, you say, well, why would they do that? Well, for three reasons. One is for medicinal purposes. To keep certain insects and parasites from the sheep. It worked as a repellent. 
One of the greatest dangers to a sheep, this is going to freak some of you out, is a thing called a nose fly. You say, what's a nose fly? Well, it's exactly what you think it is. It's a fly that would go up into the nose of the sheep and it would lay eggs and the larva would get into the brain of that sheep. And uh, if, you, if you looked and were paying attention, you'd see a sheep over by a rock just banging his head on a rock because of the larva that had grown inside that sheep's brain. And so one of the ways that a shepherd took care of that was he would take oil and he would pour it on the head of that lamb and the, lamb, the oil would come down and he would kind of rub it on the nose and that oil around that lamb's sheep's nose would keep the nose fly out of his nose. <laughs> well, you could baptize me in oil if it kept the nose fly out of my nose. How many of you could uh, give a testimony to that? But oil was also used for cuts and sores like salve or an ointment. It would soothe and it would heal. Secondly, write this down, for relational reasons. Let me explain. The shepherd deeply cared for his sheep. It didn't matter if he had 25 sheep or if he had 250 sheep. Every night, the shepherd would take his sheep and he would put them in what's called a sheepfold. Sometimes it would be a man-made sheepfold, but oftentimes it was just something up there in the rocks, there'd be a cave, and he would lead the sheep inside this place where they would be safe for the night. And this always would take place as he would lead those sheep into the sheepfold, he would count them one by one. That's, we have that story of the shepherd who had 100 sheep and he lost one. He had counted them and one had gone astray. But and, and back to our story, he would count these sheep one by one and as he was counting them, he was also examining them to see if they had any nose flies, to see if they had any cuts or if they were sick or ill, any infections. And he would anoint them with oil one by one. He didn't just take a bunch of oil and throw it at them. As they came through, he would use that rod, kind of like a turnstile, and he would anoint it with oil and let the next one go through. Because it was his flock under his care, they were his responsibility, and he made sure that his sheep were anointed with this oil. And in the same way, I want you to know that God in heaven cares about his flock. God cares about his church. This is his flock. This is his church. He cares about you. He cares about you. He cares about you. He cares about you. He cares about each and every one of us. I don't care if there's only 25 of us or if there's 25,000 of us. He cares about each and every one of us corporately and individually. So that when you go to bed and lay your head on your pillow, you can know for sure that there's a God in heaven that cares about you. And when you go through the valley of the shadow of death and you feel like you are surrounded by your enemies, you have a shepherd that cares about you. Medicinal reasons, relational reasons. Number three, for personal reasons. This might seem like a small point, but this is a very significant point. What did David say specifically? He said, you anoint my head with oil. See, David has a relationship with the good shepherd. David has a personal relationship. He didn't say, uh, God, you, you anoint all head, all the sheep with oil. He has a personal relationship, and so he writes, oh God, you have anointed my head. It's a personal relationship that David has. Think about how many people are on this planet, seven to eight 
billion people and God cares about every single one of them. Write this down, you matter to God. You matter to God. If you read this Psalm, the first four verses talks about the importance of the shepherd and, and it's good. But these later sections talk about how much the sheep actually matter to the shepherd. Oil was not cheap. Oil was expensive. So a shepherd would never waste oil on a sheep unless the sheep really mattered. And so again, I say to you that God cares about you. David, when he was about Oh, 10, 11, 12 years old. He's just a little boy. And uh, this was over in Israel. And David had seven brothers. There were eight boys living in that house. Eight boys. Can you imagine? And one day a prophet, Samuel, shows up at David's house. His dad's name was Jesse. So we call it Jesse's house. And the prophet says to Jesse, he said, Jesse, I've been sent here by God. One of your sons is to be anointed the next king of Israel. Go gather your sons. And so David or Jesse gathers up seven of the boys. He left David. David is a runt kid out in the field goofing off. Right? So Samuel says, one of your sons is going to be the next king of Israel. Go get your sons. And Jesse only brings seven. Now, this is bad parenting. <laughs> How many children do you have? You got five. Okay. Someone shows up at your house and says, hey, one of your five children is going to be the next president of the United States. Go get them. Get all five of those kids. He's told one of your sons are going to be the next king of Israel and he leaves David out there in the field and brings the seven boys. Samuel's got a horn of oil. He's going to anoint. And he looks at this first boy and goes, ah, it's not him. Hmm, not him. Goes down the line, all seven. He turns to Jesse, he says, Jesse, none of these boys are, are to be the next king. You have any other boys? And Jesse says, well, I got this kid. He's just like, he's the runt of the litter. He doesn't weigh 45 pounds dripping wet. Can't be him. He said, let me see him. So go get David. They bring David back. He stands before the prophet. And God says, this is the one. And Samuel takes this horn of oil and he anoints this boy. Oh, listen, you may think that you are insignificant. You may think that you are the runt of the litter. You may think that you're just a punk kid out in the field, that no one in your immediate family understands you. You're all, you're all alone. You might feel as though you're surrounded by your enemies and that everybody's out to hurt you. I want you to know that God sees you, God knows you, God understands you, God loves you, and God desires to anoint you with oil. We know for a fact throughout the entire Bible that oil represents the Holy Spirit of God. And when you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, God puts his spirit inside of you. You say, well, what's he doing in there? Same reason why that shepherd anointed those sheep with oil. To protect you, to help you, to guide you, to teach you, to provide for you, to lead you, to mark you as a child of the living God.
but I'm a nobody. Huh, that's kind of the point. That's kind of the point. Number three is an overflowing cup. Write that down quickly. My cup overflows. This is the third picture. It's fairly obvious. It just means that my heart and life are full. Almost too full. That God's been so good that my life, it's just the blessings of God just flow out of me. Now, stay with me. You've got to read this in context. This is a guy going through the valley of the shadow of death who's surrounded by enemies. And yet God is working to prepare everything for this sheep and to protect, to care, to provide, to guide. So that that sheep can live, right? And in the same way, and I, I know I've talked about this, it just, it's like, Everyone in our country right now is living in fear. Our country is living in the valley of the shadow of death. And they just, we walk around like we're just, like everybody's our in it. We're surrounded by our in I've seen, like I see some people, you have so much fear in you. It's like I'm walking up and it's like, oh, don't get near me. And when I meet somebody like that, I know that that person does not really know the shepherd. Yeah. Oh, you might, you might know of the shepherd, but you don't know the shepherd. Because if you knew God, if you knew Jesus, if you had a personal relationship with this shepherd, you would know that he's gone ahead of you. He has prepared everything. In the midst of your enemies, he wants you to know that you have the blessing of God upon your life. And so, even in the wilderness, even in the valley, and yes, even in the pandemic, even though I feel as though I'm surrounded by my enemies, I know the hand of God is upon me. I have nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about. <laughs> Write this down, that overflowing cup represents total satisfaction, and it represents that I have a need of nothing else. That's what it means that my cup is overflowing. If you go, ever go over to the Middle East, and I go over there when we do these trips to Israel, and anyone ever invites you inside their house, and this has happened many times, you know, like the bus driver will say, hey, come meet my family. I say, okay, I go over to this house. And when you walk in, he's had, he has a table set up, and he's got a cup that's full of hot tea. And as you sit down and as you drink, it gets about half full. He gets up and he gets some more and they come and they fill it back up. It's like a contest. <laughs> I take like three sips and he fills it up. <laughs> and as long as he keeps filling that cup up, you know what it means that he keeps filling that cup up? It means that he's having a good time and that you're, keep, stay. But there'll come a point where he won't get up and fill the cup and the cup goes empty. And when the cup goes completely empty and he doesn't get up and he go fill it up, what he's saying to you politely, hey, it's time for you to leave. <laughs> right? Well, see, God has this relationship with every one of us and he just fills our cup and he just keeps filling it and it's full to overflowing. God has filled my cup. God meets my need and then some. The cup is always full. It's I, my life. I'm just overflowing. I, my life is, is full and overflowing with God's provisions. I had food yesterday. I'm going to have food today. And I'm going to have food tomorrow. And I have water to drink. And I have a place to lay my head. I have a church in our city that, that is the greatest church ever. And, and I have all these blessings that just overflow. 
and I'm overflowing with God's forgiveness. God has forgiven me so many times. I'm, I'm overflowing with God's mercy. I'm overflowing with God's grace. I'm overflowing with God's love. And I'm overflowing with God's mercy. I'm overflowing with the Holy Spirit that is within me, his spirit, his character, overflowing with God's protection. He never leaves me. He never forsakes me. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. <laughs> overflowing simply means that you have more than you will ever need. More than you'll ever need. We see the grace of God all the way back a thousand years before Jesus Christ ever showed up. And we'll talk more about this on Easter morning. Can someone say amen? amen. I think we gotta get out of here. I got so much more to say, but I'm running out of time. I had a, there was this preacher who grew up he grew up next to an Indian reservation, so he knew all the cultural customs of the Cherokee. And this one particular tribe, he'd heard this story many times of the father who was trying to teach his son as that boy went from childhood into adulthood. They had this ritual they did. And the dad would take the boy out to the mountains, up into the forest, a place where that boy could never, ever possibly find his way back home. Take him out there. Son's getting ready to go down. And the, the ritual was, son, you have to stay right here all night long. And you're gonna become a man if you can survive. You can't move, no fire, no food, no nothing. And the dad would say to the boy, do you understand? The boy would say, yes, dad. Do you have any questions? The boy usually wouldn't ask a question. And then the last thing the father would say to that boy before he left him out there on that mountain, He'd say, son, remember this one truth. You have nothing to fear. And the dad would leave that boy up there on that mountain. The boys would tell the story, how it was the worst night of their life. Out there all alone for the first time, Every little leaf that fell, they thought it was a bear. Every noise, it was a wild coyote, they thought. No food, no fire. Out there all alone, all night long. When the sun would come up the next morning, they'd kind of rub their eyes, kind of getting used to everything. The boy would look and see someone standing over here about 30 feet away, it was his dad. That father was there all night long. Not for a second did he take his eye off that boy. And he had a gun. <laughs> and in that same way, Every one of us need to start maturing in our faith and start to realize that we have a shepherd with a rod and a staff, ninja shepherd, <laughs> who's fighting off all the enemies, the things that you think are gonna take you down, and you can rest and live a good life and a life overflowing with the goodness of God. I want us to stand as we close our service with a word of prayer. There's some doors right over here to my left. If you're here today and you need to talk to someone, if you have a prayer request, if you're going through a tough time, 
if you need to be baptized, if you don't know the shepherd, if you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, surrounded by enemies, and you don't know the shepherd, you are in trouble. You come. We have counselors, decision counselors, who want to pray with you and help you know the shepherd as your personal Lord and Savior. If you're watching online, you can just text Jesus to the number on the screen, and we'll get a hold of you. Let's bow our heads for a final word of prayer. God, thank you for today. Psalm 23 is so rich. And I can't wait to talk on verse 6, which we'll do on Easter, Lord willing. I pray, Father, today that if there is anyone within the sound of my voice that is living in fear, that God supernaturally, that you would remove that fear and replace it with faith. I'm not saying there aren't enemies out there. I'm not saying that there aren't dangers out there. But I am saying for the person that knows the shepherd, that has a personal relationship with the shepherd, that God goes before us and he sets that table. You say, well, I can't, I can't see God. Well, he's there. I don't, I don't hear God. Oh, he's there. I don't sense God. I don't sense him in my life. Oh, he's there. He's there. Lord, give us faith. Give us eyes that see. Help us to know the shepherd and to know that we are the sheep under his care. God, bless every man, bless every woman, every boy, and every girl, anoint us with your Holy Spirit and help our cup overflow, knowing that the hand of God is upon us. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming.